Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, it's confession time. One of the reasons why I really, really like doing um, these videos, especially these additional videos, is I can sort of talk with you in a way that's very, very informal and sort of let you know the stuff that goes on. So I know in my blog I've done a whole bunch of stuff that's um, of general interest. I've done a lot of talking about things like the um, National Pastime Game and its history. I've done a lot of talking about, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of games um, that you may have heard of, may have not heard of. I've talked about stuff like Dynasties. I've talked about um, stuff like uh, War, talked about different players, we're comparing different players, we're looking at different things, we're talking about the history of certain players, and then I write a lot about the replays. I'm going to be honest with you though, it's a tiring thing, sometimes I don't have the time to write as much as I want, and uh, today is going to be a problem as well as I look at what time it is, realize that my football manager blog doesn't have a post for tomorrow, so I'm going to have to come up with one, and when that happens, sometimes I kind of have to slap one together. So my story is that last night I wrote a post, which will be published tomorrow, which for you is about three weeks ago. Um, and uh, it's uh, I decided to write about the uh, end of the 1904 pennant race, something I've always wanted to look up, right? So you remember 1904, right? Um, if you're not a big baseball history geek, um, I'll tell you about it so you know about it. That was the year that there was no World Series. There was no World Series because uh, the New York Giants, John McGraw, refused to play against the American League team. There's a huge story behind this that I haven't gone into in as much depth as I would like to, right? McGraw was the man, as I've said before, who really put the American League on the map. Him going to Baltimore in 1901 solidified the American League's uh, claim as being a major league. I have argued and will always argue that the 1900 American League was more of a major league than, say, like the 1884 Union Association or the um, pre-National League National Association, these leagues that we've given major league status to. The American League was a much more um, organized league. It was much more professional. It was also more of a major league than the Negro Leagues, which came up in the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, but uh, you have to be a little bit careful talking about that. There are other problems with that, you know, uh, things that were um, that those running the Negro Leagues couldn't um, overcome in society that caused those leagues to be so haphazard. Um, but uh, the uh, 1900 American League doesn't get the credit where it's due. We always um, talk about 1901, and the big difference that made the biggest difference wasn't uh, Napoleon Lejoie, Lejoie going over to the American League. It was John McGraw. And that's obvious. As soon as you start reading through 1900 newspapers, you start realizing that, yeah, Lejoie probably had a better season slightly in 1900 than McGraw. You can make an argument 1899. 1901, it's clear who had the better season, right? Not McGraw, but McGraw was the big, big name. You talk about Pete Rose. McGraw was bigger than Pete Rose, man. I mean, McGraw was the biggest name in baseball. In 1900, there were headlines about him, and he wasn't even playing for the first month of the season. It's it's just, it's incredible. But I'll stop gushing about him. The big story there is that McGraw decides in 1904 not to play the World Series against the eventual American League champions who were the Boston Red Sox. What we forget about is that the first meaningful Red Sox-Yankees uh, late-season series was played in 1904. That's when the rivalry really is born. Now let's go take a look at this. So uh, there's your long uh, setup for nothing, and uh, we're going to go here and look at these papers. We're going to zoom in a little bit here. You can see we're on goodoldnewspapers.com. Now I'm going to start off here by showing you what the New York papers look like. Most people who do baseball research, amateur, professional, are going to start with this paper, New York Times. We'll go to the New York Times. Let's go take a look at 1908, October. We want to start October 7th. Why are we starting October 7th? Because October 7th is where the series starts. Now, um, we're not going to find much information about this in the New York Times. It's going to become very confusing. Um, you can tell I haven't really looked at this ahead of time. I don't remember which page everything is on. And... Uh, Oh, look at this. We can read about um, uh, provinces annexed by Austrian Balkan nations affected in 1908. I don't even know. I should be an expert on these international relations in history. And uh, if you know what I do for a job, you know why. I don't even know what they're talking about. So, yeah. Detroit, oh, I'm sorry. Look at this. It's 1908. I was talking about 1904. This is what happens. This is what happens when uh, it's uh, late at night and you're tired. And then instead of going to 1904, I go to April because I'm thinking four. We'll go over here to 1904, October 7th, New York Times. And this is going to be a little bit more like it, I think. And uh, let's see what we can find here. So, yeah, you have to be a little bit patient with old guys like me, you know, my uh, ripe old age, trying to find this stuff. Uh, my wife keeps asking me when my hair is going to fall out. So uh, I tell you, if I keep making mistakes like this, I'll end up pulling it out. Um, let's see if we can go backwards and find this. This is part of the joy, by the way, of newspapers.com. It's so easy to go from one page to the next. It's like I'm flipping through the paper by hand. 
And here we go. Double headers in two big leagues, right? And here we go. American League is all we care about. And see, the uh, Yankees didn't play and the Red Sox didn't play either that day. And uh, this will tell you the story. Now, look, the New York Times uh, standings would drive me nuts because um, it would just tell you games won and the percentage. No games lost. No games behind. You can see how close the percentage was. 6-17 for the Red Sox compared to 6-16 for the Yankees. And look at what game it is scheduled for today. Boston at New York. Now, I know this already. If we scroll down a little bit, there you have it. Baseball today. Look at the time. I've said this before. 3.30 p.m. is the starting time. There are no lights. It's 19.04. It's October, right? If we really want to have fun with this, we can look really quick and see if we can figure out what the weather looks like. Um, I'm not sure if the New York Times printed this or not. We'll take a quick look and see. Um, man, I love these advertisements, right? Look at this Edison photograph or a Victor talking machine from 1904. How would you like to have one of those babies? Wow, we, I tell you. My uh, my daughter always complains. She's 12. She always complains whenever I talk with her about something old. She's like, that's 100 years ago. And I'm like, no, it was about 20. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you have children, you'll feel old. You'll feel like an old man young. Uh, but uh, let's see if we can figure out what the uh, weather was like as I'm trying to think when does it get dark if the New York Times even printed that they may not here we go the weather and uh, forecast of course is looking pretty good there's the record uh, temperature average temperature thermometer is designed blah 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 and uh, do we have anything else that's a continuation it looks like there's not that's kind of unfortunate. Some of the old papers will give you the um, estimated uh, sun up and sun down time, which is also very um, important, but uh, we're not going to get that here from the Times. Thank you very much, New York Times. Uh, you know, all the news is fit to print. Um, we'll go here and look at the next day just so I can give you an, an example of kind of what this is like when you start really hunting through it and try to find out what happens with these games. All right, this might be a little bit of a longer video, and of course it's a ramble because it's late at night and this is where I'm fun. Oh, man, they have the Saturday review of books. Anyway, I'm sorry. All of my geeky hobbies are going to come out. Um, we can geek over books maybe on a different channel some different time. First game taken by Greater New York's. The New York uh, Yankees won um, the first game. Um, they just called them the New York's. <clears throat> and so the uh, New York team ends up above Boston, but with one fewer game won. And look at this. Game schedule today. New York at Boston, two games. Right, nearly 10,000 people showed up in uh, New York on uh, Hilltop Park to see this one. Now, if you've been paying attention, you're probably wondering what in the world is going on, right? So we just had the Red Sox playing at the Highlanders on October 7th. The next day, they're going up to Boston, right, for the for a double header, right? And you're saying, well, what's going on? How can this happen? I'll tell you what happened. It's right down here. Hilltop Park was rented out so that uh, the Columbia football team could play against Williams College at 3.30, right? American League Ballpark, Broadway and 166th Street. Yep, there you have it. Fifth, probably uh, 50 cents at the gate. Anyway, we'll go ahead and take a look at this. The uh, Sunday paper will have the news. Now it's the New York Times, so the uh, sports news is still going to be within the paper there's a reason why I don't like the New York Times so much because it doesn't have the best coverage in the world, right? So we go flip through this and uh, we'll find it right here. There we go. Here we go. We'll go look at the uh, baseball news first. Boston won twice from the New Yorks with the home field advantage before a crowd of nearly 30,000 people. And there's a little uh, chapter Boston back in the lead, 94 games won to 91. And um, they won uh, the first game by a 13 to 2 margin. They just completely destroyed Chesbro. What the uh, New York papers don't tell you here is that uh, the uh, Yankees were trying to start Jack Chesbro in every game, which is insane. And uh, then Boston wins one nothing in the second game. That must have been one heck of a game, man, with all of the uh, with everything at stake. Um, now I want to show you something else here, which is uh, who won that uh, Columbia Williams uh, College game, 11 nothing for um, Columbia. I mean, this is football in 1904, right? So the rules were a lot different back then. This is before the forward pass. Um, this is definitely a game of running. The tennis was 3,000, right? If they had uh, kept the uh, Red Sox-Yankees game, it would have uh, probably sold out. Instead, they have 3,000 people there at uh, Hilltop Park. Yeah, good decision, right? It's just amazing the stuff that happens in the past. We'll go look at uh, October 10th. There was no game between the two on Sunday because of the uh, blue laws, and they went back to uh, Yankees or to a Hilltop Park 
for the next day. Now you look over here and you're like, oh, there's a huge game coming up, right? It's actually a double header. And you look over here and you're like, okay, so where's the big advertisement? Where's all the information? Where is everything? It's nowhere. In fact, if you go based off of the New York Times alone, you're gonna think that nobody cared about baseball in 1904, right? Because what is this? I mean, there's like nothing in there. There's no information at all. There's no buildup for this game. This is like the biggest game, this is the biggest game in American League history to this point, right? Boston Rooters in town. So there are 200 Boston Rooters who arrive in New York who are gonna go to this game. That's about it, right? There's no other news, there's no other buildup. You know, there's nothing else going on. This is the problem. The New York Times doesn't have great coverage of, uh, you know, what at the time was actually a huge story. In fact, if you're looking for the advertising for the game, here it is. Baseball Today, two games, American League Park, New York Americans versus Boston. They even called them the Americans. First game called at 1 p.m. This is on a Monday. This is a working day. You guys remember um, that uh, game six of the 1986 um, NLCS where the Astros played against the uh, Mets? I think that one started like 1, 1.30. I was two years old, so I clearly remember it, right? But uh, I tell you, that one uh, made the entire city of New York uh, fall um, a sl or a stop you know, for the game. Man, this 1904 game was certainly going to be about the same. And you go over here and you just see Boston's win American League championship, nearly 30,000 rooters um, out, right? You missed out on a lot of potential revenue. I know it's cut off. It's okay. We can still see the final score, 3-2. to two. Very, very close game in the first game, and that's the one that Boston won to win the title. That is a famous game, by the way, that uh, Dela or that uh, Chesbro lost by throwing a wild pitch with a runner on third in the top of the ninth inning. Chesbro had been overworked. Unfortunately, you can't read this. If you look at the old newspaper, or newspapers, the encyclopedia that um, the New York Times put out, there's a famous one, uh, Encyclopedia of Sports Baseball, that I have an electronic copy of here. I'll show that to you a different day. Um, uh, if you look at paper at uh, books like that, you won't find this game. Now you know why, because the people who took, this is the official uh, microfish, microfilm, um, and I don't know when these pictures were taken. I'm guessing it may have been back then. Look at what happened to this page, right? You can't read it. You can make out like a little bit of it, and that's it. You can't read the full article, right? What a shame. That's kind of the way it is. New York won the second game, won nothing, but it didn't really matter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's see. Yep, ten inning game. There you have it. So what we've learned from this is kind of what the New York Times looks like, right? And you know, for most people who are doing this research. Most people I've dealt with over all of the years have been interested in this. Most of them just have access to that, and it's going to be good enough for them, and they think, oh, well, that's what the coverage was like. And, yeah, baseball wasn't quite that big in 1904. Maybe American League baseball wasn't that big, right? People didn't care about it so much. Well, let's go take a look over here, all right? You're going to, uh, if you haven't seen this before, you're going to be shocked. This is the Boston Daily Globe, October 7th, 1904, and guess what? Baseball is on the front page. First game of final series today, Collins team attitude. This is interesting. I won't go into the detail. You can read the uh, posts that I made about this, but what's going on is um, the, uh, the double header that was set up in between the first game and then the second doubleheader at uh, Hilltop Park. The doubleheader that was played in Boston was the result of negotiation between the two teams because of the idiotic um, scheduling of football that had happened ahead of time when the Highlanders thought they weren't going to be in the pennant. There's a lot more research that needs to go into that, right? All right, so yeah, Chicago to New York in 58 hours, 35 minutes. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Man, Wow. I can get I can get all the way to Los Angeles from here faster than that. Um, anyway, but yeah, look at this. You have a little bit of coverage of this game, right? It's looking okay. And uh, what we're really interested in, though, is uh, do we have a, a good advertisement for that uh, big doubleheader tomorrow, right? So that was a front page story. I want to note that front page story. What we're looking here when we look to find uh, the uh, baseball advertisements, we are always are looking for the advertisements for theater. Right in the old days, advertising for uh, for advertising for uh, baseball games generally was on the same page where you would see advertisements for live theater, for vaudeville, and for stuff like that. Right, something to keep in mind. You need to keep this in mind when you're thinking about like how did this work, how did this happen, and stuff like this. How did people figure out what was going on? You need to find a page like this. Right, the Shogun was a big show back then. The Wizard of Oz, right, a, a, a theater production. 
I have a friend who's into theater history and into musicals and stuff like that. He probably knows what's going on. The Days of 49, that's like my Diamond Mine series, except it's 1849. There's horse racing, Boston Symphony Orchestra. This is before jazz music was, you know, a socially acceptable thing. And here you go. American League, Huntington Avenue, Saturday, two games, starting at 1.30, which means it's a single admission doubleheader. Admission to the grandstand, 75 cents, pavilion, 50 cents, and then general admission, everything else, 25 cents. One of these days I'm going to have a video where I talk about like what the difference is, right? Because um, I don't even think any of these were reserved seats back in those days. You just had three different tiers of seating, right? Man, it was so much different back then. But yeah, starting at 1.30. Now, let's see if we can figure out when uh, there was a sunset here. And uh, maybe we'll have some better luck here with uh, this, um, you know, lower paper than the famous New York Times in uh, finding some weather information that's useful. Because I want to know when the sun went down back then, uh, so we have an idea of how fast these guys had to play, right? Because 1.30, today 1.30 is your basic uh, starting time for a day game, right? For like a Saturday day game. We're talking about a Saturday doubleheader starting at 1.30, right? Gives you an idea of why these guys will play so fast. So my apologies as I go through here really, really quick and try to find uh, some kind of weather information. And uh, there's your stock market, uh, there's your uh, stories and all of that stuff. I may end up uh, completely striking out here. Let's see what happens. Um, a good one in the running, and there's a whole bunch of this. Oh, my gosh. Look at this run right here. Marry me, Cecil, and I will buy the ring of the Wilston Jewelry Country of their own factory and to order any size wedding ring in two hours. The largest ring department in New England open evenings. Ha! <laughs> How about that one? Ha! <laughs> All right, we'll uh, we'll uh, try to stick away from these. There's advertisements for divorces in here, man. Oh man, no weather there. And so yeah, we have struck out in the weather department. I'm sorry to say. Oh no, what is this? What is this? What is this right here? This is probably what I'm looking for. Moon changes. Yep, sun rises 5:48, sun sets 5:16. So your game starts at one, what was that, one, one thirty, right, for the double header. We'll go back and take a look. You have until five, probably a little bit about five o'clock before it starts really getting dark, right? Keep that in mind when you're talking about why did people play so fast in those days, you know, and oh, well, they didn't care. They were just swinging at everything. Well, it might be that there was, you know, some sort of, uh, I don't know, incentive for uh, people to actually finish the game right, that we don't have today because we have lights, right? And it's not just a case of me being an old fuddy-duddy. Yeah, two games starting at 1.30. I mean, you have less than two hours per game, right, is what you have um, uh, uh, registered. And we're talking about the sun setting at 5, whatever it was, 5.16, right? I mean, which means that it's going to be dusk like around 4.30, right? Keep that in mind. When we talk about the way things were in the old days, you have to remember this stuff. Now we go to October 8th. Um, and uh, hope that everything doesn't freeze on us, and it doesn't. I've looked at this before. I know where everything is. It's actually really easy. It's all on the first page. Passed in the race, Boston beaten in New York, and um, here's your standings. New York's 91 and 56. The Boston's 92 and 58, and they've got four games to go against each other. You can see, again, these are not going to be even. 9,503 showed up in New York, which is the pitiful crowd, given how important this game was. Go over here to page four, and we'll see what we have here. And uh, yeah, we have a little bit of stuff. This is what I like about this. So when you can see um, one of these uh, advertisements or these uh, cartoons here, and this is the stuff that we miss in our papers today. I mean, nobody reads the newspapers today anyway, but uh, these great drawings, you know, I mean, when newspapers went away from those drawings and went towards having only photos, that's, that was not a good decision. October 9th, this is that double header. Great day for the champions. No, nearly 30,000 people see Boston win twice from New York. And look at this. You have the same thing again. There's the Bostons. And the New Yorks are drawn up here as Scotsmen. So I, there's got to be some reason for that. I don't know. Chesbro was unlucky in the fourth, gave up six runs, right? And um, there you have it with uh, Deneen in the box, 13 to 2. And with uh, Young, good old side pitching, it was uh, 1 0. And uh, we're going to take a look over here on page number five. Uh, before we do that, though, I mean, look at this. I love this. Championship possibilities. If Boston wins both games Monday, it captures the championships, championship 623 to 603. If Boston wins one and ties one, it wins 621 to 607. If Boston loses one and ties one, it takes the 614 to 613. 
New York wins both at his champion 616 to 610. If it rains, preventing both games, Boston has already won 619 to 611. There's nothing in here about like maybe they're going to or replay it or whatever. And if it had rained, man, that would have been a real interesting part of baseball history, wouldn't it? Look at all this stuff that you learn if you don't just limit yourself to New York Times and instead you go and uh, find other things. And this is the crazy part right here, right? You ever want to see a photo of what it was like there? Here you go. Right? This is a photo from the game. This is what it looked like. This is not a drawing. This is a photo. This is a panoramic photo taken from the grounds. It's not the greatest photo I've ever seen in my life, but this is what Huntington Avenue grounds looked like from back here. This is a photo you don't see very often. Here's uh, people perched up on the uh, telegraph po uh, pole in the uh, railroad train yard, complete with a ladder. This guy got to be careful. I hate seeing that, man. I'm, I'm uh, worried about falling when I watch that. This looks a lot like those uh, crowds. If you ever watch uh, British football, uh, soccer, sorry, games from the 60s or 70s, you see a lot of uh, scenes like this as well, right? You think that's cool. You think that's cool. Come over here. This is the page before. Here's uh, Fred Parent at the bat. We remember him. We've seen him before. Photograph shows how close to home plate were the spectators. Does that look really close to you? No. But there was overspill and overflow seating there. There's 30,000 people here at this uh, little ballpark. And here you have policemen preserving the lion by force of arms. Right? This is just amazing. This is absolutely amazing, man. You have all of these photos, all of this great stuff here. Go check out the blog. Check out the blog, blog post. I'm going to have a link down below for a little bit more information. I will finish this off. I know this is 20-something minute video. None of you guys are uh, here anymore because uh, nobody wants to hear me geek out. This is the buildup, right? Remember, the New York Times had nothing. They meet today for supreme tests. Champions in good shape and expect to win one of two games in New York. Yeah, champions. You forgot about the 1903 Red Sox, didn't you? And um, <laughs> hoot, moon, I need them boot. Yeah, it was a little bit different back in those days, and there are only two left, and uh, New York needs to win both of them if they want to be the champions. There's no talk, of course, about uh, who ends up going to the World Series because there uh, was no World Series. In fact, they knew by then, and I've, I've jumped over this. You have to go look at the blog to figure it out. They knew by then that there was not going to be any World Series. Uh, that article had been printed a couple of days before. Um, and here are uh, picture, a, a picture of the Royal Rooters. Uh, what did we say, about 200? That looks like about 200 people um, who uh, went on that train to go to New York um, hoping to uh, cheer the team on to victory. And uh, so there you go. And now we go for the grand finale, October 11th, 1904. Boston champions capture the pennant. New York is beating the great contest after making a gallant fight. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> who says Boston isn't the center of the universe, and there's the pennant. I'm not a Red Sox fan. I'm not a Boston fan, but I'm going to tell you that I'm definitely a fan of the old Boston Daily Globe because this coverage is just absolutely fantastic. This is great coverage. This is great coverage, and this makes it so much fun to read. It really does, and if you think that that wasn't enough, you've got to see what these pages are like, man. This stuff is so cool. So, uh, yeah, here you go. Here is uh, Nuff Said McGreevy and Jerry Watson leading the cheering of the Rooters. Uh, this all reminds me of, you know, remember back in uh, 2004 when uh, we had all that talk about the uh, Tessie, you know, I love you madly and all that stuff. And uh, we had the Dropkick Murphys and all that stuff doing the recordings. This is what they were talking about. Well, this is what it really looked like back then. I mean, this is amazing. These are photographs, you know, from then of exactly what happened, you know. And uh, here we are um, presenting the sealskin coat, cap, and gloves to Chesbro, I'm assuming, before the game, right? <laughs> Chesbro probably had a lot to worry about. Here's the Royal Rooters, all 200 of them. I mean, this is not much of a crowd at all, marching up to the grounds. Oh, man, I tell you, these old newspapers these old newspapers are a treat. It is a treat to read this stuff. If you don't geek out over this stuff, I can't understand you. And here you go. These are the champions here. World champions and twice champions of the American League, the uh, Boston uh, Red Sox. Um, and uh, there you have it. President Taylor challenges to just five games for the championship of the world. The players will be given receipts. After the game, President John, I, President John I. Taylor sent the following message to manager John McGraw. But as the New York players were paid off this afternoon and many of them started for home, there was little chance of anything coming out of the challenge. Yeah, many of them started for home, right? Remember that when you're playing your 1904 replay with Apple. John J. McGraw manager of the New York baseball team. Dear sir, as the Boston Club today won the championship of the American League, I challenge your club to play for the championship of the world. Of course, if you refuse to play, we hold the title by default. 
but because they won the year before, but I should prefer to win it on the diamond in a series of five or more games. As to the gate receipts, I'm willing that all should go to the players. A reply tonight will greatly oblige your sincerely, John I. Taylor. So that didn't happen, as we all know. There was no World Series that season, and uh, there you have it. Anyway, this is a very long video. I probably have lost um, all of my audience, but uh, I love this stuff, man. I mean, I don't understand how anybody would find it uninteresting. This is the most fascinating stuff in the world to me. I just, I can't get enough of it. I love reading about it. I love looking through it. I love the history of the sport. I love everything about it. Sport today is fun, but is nothing compared to what it was before. There's so much, uh, so much character to it. There's so much history. There's so much about American history that's going on. There are so many little things that you notice. Man, I tell you, if I could be paid full time to just sit around and, and you know, stroll through those newspapers and uh, taking the smells and the feels and the sights and all that stuff, I would just love it, man. I love it to death. And there you go. Well, uh, you know, a guy can always hope, right? Um, we'll leave it at that. I'm hoping you have a good day, and um, I will uh, see you again tomorrow. As always, look down below, and we'll have a link to the blog post so you can um, read this at your own pace and see what the reporting was like. And remember, if you're doing your own research for your own replay, do not limit yourself to the New York Times. Its sports coverage is awful. Go to different papers. Go to the Chicago Tribune. You want to go to the Boston Globe. You want to go to the great papers over in Pittsburgh and St. Louis. Remember the Cincinnati Inquirer from 1900. Excellent, excellent paper that's very, very underrated. Philadelphia Inquirer has pictures. It is pictures of games in the American League in 1901. Can you believe that? If you told me that when I was, I don't know, like 16 years old and uh, growing up on old issues of the Apple Journal, I would have absolutely wigged out, man. I would have been totally crazy for this stuff, right? I mean, it's just amazing, the stuff that's out there. And it's easy to get access to this, right? I don't understand why more people aren't into it. Anyway, I've talked to you enough. I'm not going to have a voice tomorrow. You know how it is. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.